start by thanking Jeff for that amazing introduction. Like you, I would love to see the person he described. It's a pity that he's not here uh, uh, tonight. Um, uh, s secondly, I'm really uh, overwhelmed and grateful to see so many of you here. Of course, having heard from Julian the astonishing description of all the distinguished philosophers that have preceded me that lulled you into the false belief this would also be an interesting series, so let me apologize in advance. And uh, I owe uh, uh, an apology as well to the Uhiro uh, uh, Center. These are the Uhiro Lectures in Practical Ethics that would... Uh, probably make you think these were going to be lectures in practical ethics. Uh, as you will see, uh, although technically I'm talking about animal ethics, it's about as far from anything practical as you could conceivably get. Um, so don't think you're going to emerge from uh, however many of these lectures you, 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 you tough it through. Uh, now actually knowing you know, which medical experimentations, if any, are, are, are justified or, or something like that. I, I'm, I'm going to be pursuing certain theoretical questions which seem to me need to be worked out uh, in this practical domain, but I'm very far from having practical uh, uh, recommendations that emerge from it. Uh, last apology, maybe, maybe the whole talk should just be a series of apologies. Last apology, uh, um, I probably lured falsely at least a few of you in with the titles of the talks. Uh, I think tonight's is uh, uh, consequentialism for cows. Tomorrow is tomorrow is uh, deontology for dogs. Uh, uh, Wednesday is uh, foundations for frogs. Uh, don't be deceived. I won't be talking about cows or dogs or frogs. I just was really taken by the possibility of the consonants um, of the t of the titles. Uh, so let me say what it is I do want to do, uh, which is I I'm going to be. Uh, Today, making some discussions in, in value theory, uh, remarks about uh, the part of moral theory where we uh, talk about uh, which outcomes are better or worse than others, uh, roughly speaking. And, and the reason for the original title, Consequentialism uh, for Cows, then, was because for a very simple moral theory, as it happens, the kind that I myself am a, I'm a fan of, once you've got your value theory in place, the, the instructions about right and wrong, at least at the theoretical level, are they, they fall out fairly quickly. The right thing to do is to do the action that has the best results. That's the, that's the core idea behind consequentialism. So you need to work out how do you tell the good results from the bad results, uh, but, the, but the rest of it kind of follows uh, pretty quickly in its wake. And so what I want to do today is, is, is value theory. A lot of people are not consequentialists. Now, I've got, a, I imagine, a kind of mixed audience here. I know some of you are professional philosophers or, or graduate students. I know that, at least in principle, there were going to be some uh, high school students here with perhaps not the same uh, philosophy background. So I'll be flipping back and forth between uh, going too high, probably, at some points for some of the audience and, and being... Uh, dumbing it down too much for other audiences, and so if I'm really successful, everybody will be unsatisfied. Um, uh, a lot of people aren't consequentialists. A lot of people are deontologists, and they think there's more to right and wrong than just uh, bringing about the best results or certain actions that would be wrong, even if the results were good. Uh, and so you've got a much more complicated theory of the right, as, as we sometimes put it. And so that's tomorrow's uh, topic, thinking about uh, the issues I want to talk about in the context of a deontological perspective. Despite the nifty, uh, clean divisions of the titles, the deontology stuff will probably, almost inevitably, I'm pretty sure, spill over uh, onto Wednesday. Uh, and so there'll be more deontology on Wednesday, if anybody's still here. Uh, and then I will have some remarks about foundations, by which I mean theories about the foundations of ethics, where do the basic rules uh, come from? I don't mean in a causal sense, but what's their ultimate grounding or justification? So, so that's where we're going. Kind of value theory today, deontology tomorrow, and some of the next day, and then concluding with some foundational remarks. And, and, and just to give you a, a quick overview of the position that I mean to be defending, I want to be arguing on behalf of uh, hierarchy uh, in ethics when thinking about how to treat uh, animals. 
Uh, that is to say, the idea I, I am a fan of, I think strikes a lot of people as pretty obviously correct, but doesn't seem to me to have been much developed in uh, the bits of the philosophical literature that I'm familiar with. The, the, the idea I have is that uh, not every creature that counts morally has the same uh, moral standing, has the same moral status. Uh, to put the point kind of quickly and intuitively without trying to pack too much into it, some of us have rights that others don't. And in particular, I think that uh, people, you know, creatures like you and I, uh, have rights that other animals, I perfectly recognize the fact that, of course, we're animals, but it gets tiresome to always be saying non-human animals. So when I say animals, I mean non-human animals. And, and what I really mean are animals that aren't people, perfectly open a possibility, uh, there's some evidence to suggest that there may be others on the planet besides Homo sapiens that satisfy the, the relevant conditions for being a person. I should probably say just a term about how I'm going to use that language. I, I hear you use it in the way that's very common among professional philosophers. Uh, to distinguish between a Homo sapiens and a person, a person is a self conscious being, aware of itself as one among many, with a sense of having a future, maybe having plans with regard uh, for the future. The exact uh, the exact contours of what goes into being a person is controversial, um, but uh, these can come apart. Human versus uh, human is a biological term. Uh, person, uh, Superman uh, is a person, but he's not a Homo sapiens. He comes from another planet, another biological uh, species. And sadly, there are. Uh, tragically, there are Homo sapiens that are not persons because of impairment in their cognitive development. They never become self-conscious, aware of themselves, uh, uh, that sort of thing. At any rate, so the thought is that the people, maybe there are some non-human people, uh, people count in a way that other animals don't, so there's a higher status that we have, uh, and that uh, even within the animal kingdom, there are uh, differences that need to be drawn, so there are higher and lower status uh, animals as well. And it, uh, what this carries with it, or maybe what that kind of language just encapsulates, is the idea that there are various claims that uh, uh, the higher status creatures have that the lower status creatures don't have, uh, morally speaking, or perhaps the claims are weightier or, or something like that. Exactly how you spell that out, that's some of uh, effectively what we're going to be worrying about over the course of the next couple of days. Uh, last preliminary remark, I suppose, is this. Um, I, I, I say all this, I, I, I give uh, these talks with considerable misgivings. Right? Given the uh, quite, I mean, just utterly appalling history of human abuse and mistreatment of animals, uh, which typically went with a kind of philosophical view according to which animals just didn't count. Um, uh, our lifestyle is just, uh, uh, from start to finish, so every aspect of it, uh, strewn with, well, as I say, the abuse uh, of animals. Uh, and many, one of the most striking things over the last half century, actually, has been, uh, yeah, if, you, if you went back and looked at moral philosophers from roughly a half century ago, and before, almost the entire history of philosophy, there was virtually no discussion of, of animals at all. Uh, you get an occasional passing remark, but no serious uh, discussion of them. The pendulum has swung in a very striking way over the last uh, half century, uh, and I'm not sure if there's a single position that's dominant, but a very prominent position has gone really 180 degrees, whatever the metaphor should be, in the, the opposite direction, where now a lot of people say, well, in a way that I'll try to spell out later, really animals count exactly the way that, that humans count. Um, uh, their claims, their pains uh, count equally uh, with, with uh, the, the claims uh, that the human people you know, have. Um, it would be natural to call that position an egalitarian position, right? Because the, 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 the claim, a kind of an otherwise equal claim made by a dog um, uh, has a, a, an interest of a dog, comp corresponding interest by, uh, uh, by a person, counts equally. So be, as I say, it would be natural to call that an egalitarian position. Sadly, that word's already owned by, well, the egalitarians, uh, those people who uh, 
believe in certain distributive principle where equality is good, inequality is bad, in a way that we'll also talk about later. Uh, so we need some other name uh, for the view that I'll be talking of. Sort of my, my foil will be this egalitarian position, and I need a name for it. For lack of a better name, I'm going to call it the Unitarian uh, position. Uh, you can probably see the um, uh, reason for calling it that. The, the idea is it's just a single status, and again, I'll try to clarify this, uh, and, and, and we share it with uh, the other animals, so the Unitarians. Now, of course, I don't know how prominent Unitarians are in England. There are, it's, it's, a, it's a religion in, in, in the United States, so the Unitarians got there first as well, but um, you don't get a lot of Unitarians showing up in the animal ethics literature, uh, qua Unitarians, and so I think I can, I can take over their word in an imperialistic fashion, their, their name, uh, without too much danger of misunderstanding, whereas if I used egalitarianism, that would uh, confuse people, especially since later today I'll be talking about principles of equality, and I mean them in the sense that the egalitarians uh, believe in them. All right. I started talking about this because I said, I say all this with misgivings, right, that... that I, I'm worried that some people aware, becoming aware of the ideas that I've had, uh, that, I, that I'm developing, uh, uh, will come away thinking, oh, so the way we treat animals is, is okay. And, and no, no, the way we treat animals is just utterly deplorable, completely unacceptable. Um, and, and that falls out pretty quickly and trivially from the egalitarian, unitarian position. Um, uh, and so from that point of view, it kind of would be nice if that were true. But as far as I can see, it's just not true. Uh, and so that we need this more complicated position, which in principle opens the door to saying, oh, so the way we treat animals is, is justified. But it doesn't. It's not committed to that. Uh, and I believe, in fact, you know, even once the more complicated hierarchy view gets worked out, uh, it will still be the case, what I take to be the case, uh, that the way we treat animals is, is by and large, you know, utterly unacceptable. So as I say, I say it with, with some misgivings, but nonetheless, it does seem to me that the Unitarian position isn't quite right. Well, so actually, even before we get to Unitarianism proper, um, it's probably best to start by saying something about this notion of differential status, and probably the more elementary notion is one of standing uh, and so, and these terms get thrown around, not always meaning exactly the same things uh, among the people in the literature who use them. Uh, the, the idea I've got of, of standing, uh, not at all unique to me, uh, is that something has standing, A, if there are moral rules that govern how it can be treated, uh, but B, it's kind of a subset of that, um, if you break the rules, you're wronging the thing with standing, uh, it, it counts for its own sake, uh, as we might put it. All right, so, you know, if I were to, uh, uh, you know, stab you, volunteer from the audience, well, you didn't volunteer, but <laughs> if I were to stab you, uh, you know, that would be wrong. There are rules saying I shouldn't do that. But intuitively, we'd want to say beyond that, you'd be the person, you'd be the object I was wronging. Uh, uh, it, it's something about you that explains why it is I owe it to you uh, to, to, to not kill you, not to hurt you. Suppose, in, in, in contrast, if, uh, uh, I, I can't tell whether that plant over there is live or not, but you know, if I go over and, and uh, you know, pull off some uh, uh, leaves off of, of a plant, we don't normally think that that's wrong. Certainly when you pull a, a leaf of grass uh, off, a, off a sidewalk, or not a sidewalk, but a you know, lawn, that, we don't think that's wrong. Um, of course, there could be circumstances in which it is wrong. Maybe it would be wrong for me to do this here, because you know, this, this, this plant belongs uh, 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 you know, to this institution. And, and if the leaves I'm pulling off of, the plant off of are you know, your prize orchid, uh, then, of course, that's wrong. But um, the reason it's wrong is because I owe it to you not to destroy your prize orchid. It's not that the prize orchid counts in its own right. So it doesn't have moral standing. And so the question is, well, so what things have moral standing? Uh, and uh, sort of the, the animal ethics literature is basically uh, growing out of the thought that animals have standing too, uh, though perhaps not the same status uh, not the exact same set of claims, or maybe, yes, the same set of claims. That's the issue that we'll be thinking about. But we might start by wondering what it is that gives you standing or status. And you know, a, a natural thought, I mean, here's the kind of example that gets discussed in the literature. You know, I, I bring a, a cat. Um, 
I douse it with gasoline, and I set it on fire. Um, and we all sit back and listen to it shrieking in agony. Uh, this will clearly be uh, uh, wrong to do. I mean, I, I, again, I should, I should say one more bit of preliminary stuff that I'm going to be making a whole lot of claims over the next couple of days. And occasionally I'll have something that, if you squint, may look a little bit like an argument. It, it, it's, it's, it's not really, you know, if anybody doesn't find the cat on fire example persuasive, there's nothing that I'm going to say that's going to persuade you. I have no deeper argument. Uh, uh, so you can just, you know, so, so, so for those of you who don't share the intuition, you can just say, all right, let's see Shelley work out of you to his own satisfaction. I don't know why you would find that interesting, but that's all you're going to be left with. Um, uh, but I'm going to assume that you know, all, I hope all of you think, all right, you know, that would be horrible. And it's not just that it would be wrong to set the cat on fire. Maybe it's a stray. It doesn't belong to anybody. Uh, it's wrong for the cat's sake. Uh, and so the cat has standing. If you ask, why does it have standing? Natural answer, the obvious answer is because it's in pain when you set it on fire. It's in agony when you set it on fire. And a whole lot of uh, animal ethics literature, then when it asks the question, so, so which things count, go with that thought. They say uh, the ability to feel pleasure and pain is the grounding of uh, what uh, uh, gives you standing at all. Uh, it's typically put in terms of the language of sentience, sentiences, necessary and sufficient uh, uh, for counting. Uh, I think I won't take the time to go there, but for those of you who are uh, you know, professional philosophers, it seems to me that's not the right label, right? Sentience gets used for any time you've got the ability to have qualitative experiences. They needn't be limited to the ability to feel pleasure and pain. Uh, and, and so that's a bit of a misleading label, but it's a common enough label, and for our purposes, I think it probably won't be crucial. Uh, all right, so, so the thought is sentience or the ability to feel pleasure and pain. That's what gives you moral standing. The cat has it. Um, and you know, other mammals clearly have it. We might puzzle as to how far down the evolutionary tree uh, we can go and, and, and still have this kind of conscious experience uh, where there's this qualitative aspect, as, as philosophers sometimes put it. This is a very common thought. It seems to me it's probably at least the part of the claim where it says, in order to have standing, you must have sentience. That seems to me probably wrong. Uh, let me share with you I want to read a passage. I won't, I won't, it's not especially important who, um, for our purposes who, who it's from. Um, the, 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 the philosopher I'm about to quote, who works in animal ethics, uh, asks us to, to consider the following thought experiment. You get uh, abducted by space aliens, and they're going to take you off to their, you know, their, their home, uh, where they're either going to keep you in some intergalactic zoo or maybe do worse things uh, you know, to you. Uh, and, uh, but, but they're able to understand English or you've learned their language, whatever it is. And so, so she asks you to imagine how you might try to persuade these space aliens with whom you can communicate you know, that, that doing this would, would be wrong. And, and so here's the long quote, the, the imagined speech that she offers. You might express your desire not to be held captive. This is going to be a rather long quote. That being held against your will is wrong and that prevents you from doing not just the things you want to be doing at home, but the things you're supposed to be doing. These aliens are frustrating your desires and preventing you from fulfilling your obligations to others. You might explain that you're a rational and sensitive individual who has immediate desires and long-term plans that you hope to satisfy. You don't think you should be treated as a means to some alien ends. You might try to bargain with them, telling them you will do something from them if, for them if they do something for you. You have relationships to others that you want to continue to pursue. You would be willing to develop a relationship with them if they respect you. You value your freedom and your ability to make choices. You need to be with your friends, family, and others of your kind. If you're forced to stay with the aliens, you will become bored, frustrated, lonely, angry, and depressed. You may even die. Holding you captive against your will harms you in many, many ways. And, and, and she imagines that this speech is, is compelling, that we were supposed to imagine the aliens not oblivious or insensitive to moral considerations. They're open to moral uh, uh, considerations. And, and this speech uh, is supposed to persuade creatures that can morally reason that, look, uh, kidnapping you is wrong. 
You can imagine, since this comes from a book on animal ethics, that the claim is going to then be a comparable speech could be made on behalf of animals, right? And I find that comparable speech that we might imagine persuasive, just as I find this speech not a bad take on what sorts of things you might say. The thing I want to actually emphasize uh, here is, notice how very little of this speech said anything about your being sentient, about your ability to feel pleasure and pain. I mean, there's, there was a passing reference to your being a sensitive being, and maybe that's a way of of bringing in that fact. And, and some of this stuff about boredom or feeling angry and depressed at the end might be painful mental states. Um, but that, that's just passing. The bulk of the speech doesn't talk about sentience. It talks about the fact that you've got various desires, uh, preferences about what you want to have happen in your life and what you want to do with yourself uh, uh, and things, you know, things that you want to accomplish. Uh, and that left to your own devices, you would go ahead and act on these desires. Uh, and, but if you're kidnapped, uh, then all that gets frustrated. You don't get to act on your various uh, preferences. Uh, it would be helpful to have, that's the thing that actually does the core of the persuading, to, to my mind, uh, in this passage, uh, suggesting that what really grounds standing uh, is this complex of having preferences and the ability to act on them and so forth. It would be helpful to have a name for that. The name I'm going to use uh, occasionally is agency. Um, and, again, among philosophers, that's a loaded term. Sometimes people mean a very fancy set of things when they talk about agents. I've got in mind something very minimal, uh, just this thought that, look, there are goals you have, preferences about what you want to do, how you want your life to go, and left your own devices, you know, you get to act on them. But the agents are, rather the aliens are, interfering with your will about how you want your life to go. So agency seems to me to be really, really important uh, for standing. Uh, and... Uh, what that means to me is that as we, as we go down the evolutionary tree, what we ought to be focusing on, maybe not exclusively, uh, 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 but certainly significant, is how far down does agency go? And, and the reason I mention this is because I don't really know, I, I think you know, we don't yet know, uh, how far down uh, consciousness goes, uh, the ability to feel pleasure and pain, see colors as colors, uh, um, uh, but agency seems much more kind of on the surface. Um, I don't know whether insects are conscious, uh, but it seems to me they manifest a kind of at least rudimentary uh, level of agency, and so a whole lot more may count um, if that's the relevant ground for moral standing. Of course, it doesn't tell us how they should count, but it does at least open the door to the thought that um, animal ethics may eventually bring under its wing a whole lot more uh, than we have already been inclined uh, to think might, might fall on, under it. Uh, in fact, not, it wouldn't be limited. Once you start thinking this way, it won't be limited to animals. Um, it seems to me we ought to be able to imagine uh, an interesting test case would be you know, a creature that was not conscious, yet nonetheless manifest and displayed agency. Um, uh, I don't know whether you've all seen the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, for anybody here who hasn't seen it, uh, cover your ears. I'm about to ruin the central plot device. Um, uh, there's a computer, Hal, uh, who uh, tries to kill the astronaut. He's running, Hal is running uh, the, 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 the spaceship. And uh, he can, tries to kill the astronauts on the ship uh, because he thinks, reasonably enough, humans tend to screw things up. Um, this is way too important a mission to rely on humans to do it. He ought to take over. Uh, and he succeeds in, in, in killing off all the aliens except for, uh, all the uh, astronauts except for uh, uh, Dave, uh, and then Dave man. But it's so, it, it seems to me what's going on, I find myself unhesitatingly wanting to say something like, uh, Hal, the computer, uh, displays agency. Uh, he's got preferences, he's got desires, he's got goals, he, he wills various things, he acts on them very effectively. Uh, this is a high degree of agency. But, you know, like other people uh, who've read too much science fiction, uh, I don't really know. Is, is Hal conscious or not? I, 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 I'm probably not. Um, uh, but I don't care. Uh, I mean, Hal is, of course, murderous, so it's not like I think, oh, let him be. Uh, but in some sense, he has moral standing. Uh, when you turn Hal off, uh, which is what Dave does uh, effectively, uh, then uh, you are doing something that has moral weight because of what you're doing to Hal. Um, all right. So 
there's going to be some wide range of things, maybe not even limited to animals, that have moral standing in the sense that I've got in mind because they manifest agency, or, or maybe some things that have sentience but not agency, maybe they'll count as well. There's more to say about that, but instead of pursuing that. Um, so, so the next question is, so what should we say of the things that have standing? Do they all have the same standing? If we use the word status to, to, as a kind of shorthand for what is, what's the set of claims that you're able to make and, and how much they weigh vis-a-vis uh, -vis other creatures' claims and, their, and, and the weight of those claims, then we might ask, does everything have the same status or is it differential? Uh, status here. And the Unitarians, have, as I've already suggested, uh, think that the answer is there's just one status. Things that have any kind of moral standing at all, in the sense that I've talked about, have that very same single status, hence my name, Unitarianism. Now you might think, look, this, that's surely a, a logically possible view, but it can't, can't be right, even though there's a number of prominent advocates of it, not under that label, I made up the label, um, but uh, people who have effectively committed themselves to that idea. There's a lot of uh, uh, advocates of it. Um, and my thing, what happens is just as a non-starter, at least for a lot of us, uh, look, you know, there you are trying to choose between, imagine there's a, you know, a, a human being drowning, a person uh, drowning, and uh, I don't know, a chicken drowning. I don't know whether chickens can swim or not, suppose not. Um, a dog drowning, you know, some, some, you know, some chicken drowning. Uh, and uh, are the Unitarians saying, so they have an equal claim on me to save their life? Uh, and so, I don't know, I have to flip a coin or something with that and choose in between them? Because if that was the implication, you know, that would be a very hard position to uh, uh, embrace. And of course, philosophy is full of being led to positions that are very hard to embrace. So I don't really mean that as a, and that shows it's wrong, but at least it shows it's, you know, it's a position, if that's the implication, it's worth worrying about uh, what the alternatives to it are. But as it happens, Unitarians typically aren't committed to anything like that. So to, to see that, uh, it, it, it certainly doesn't follow from their position there's a single status that therefore you must save the, the chicken or, fl uh, or flip a coin or what have you. To see that, imagine that two people, I don't know, Jack and Jill, um, uh, both need help, uh, but uh, uh, Jack needs a whole lot more than Jill. Jill's got a paper cut. She'd like a Band-Aid or something like that. Jack's got um, uh, some horrible migraine, and you could go get something that would take care of the migraine. Now, uh, intuitively, at that point, what you ought to do, if you can't help both, is you ought to help uh, uh, Jack with the migraine. Why? Because he has, he's in so much greater suffering, so much more harm undergoing, do the, he's doing so much more good to rescue him. Okay, so I suppose we agree with that, but of course that observation doesn't mean then that, uh, that Jack has a higher moral status than Jill. Um, no, they have the same moral status, and what their same moral status comes to is something like, their harms count unit for unit the same amount, uh, morally speaking. And since he's got a much bigger harm, there's more units of harm or something like that. And so you, we can say that even though the status is, this is what the Unitarians will say, we can say even though the status is the same, that's compatible with helping Jack precisely because he has so much, he would lose so much more if we don't help him. Or, you know, similarly, if he, if he were drowning and it's merely that, uh, you know, Jill is about to stub her toe and you could shout out and, and, and stop her from doing that. You know, he has more on the, at stake than she does. So that's perfectly compatible with uh, saying they have the same moral status. All right, so then the Unitarians say, uh, to my mind very plausibly, look, in the drowning case with the dog, whether the human and the chicken or the human and the dog, um, the human, not in every single conceivable case, but almost always, has a whole lot more at stake than uh, the dog does. Uh, the, the kinds of lives that we are capable of uh, having um, contain all sorts of goods which just give us a much greater level of well-being. Our lives are better for us to have that is to say, your, the benefit to you of your living your life is just greater, and consequently the threat to you of the danger of losing your life is that much greater. And the, you know, the chicken has well-being too, uh, but 
uh, the amount of well-being it has on the table is just significantly less. Chickens just can't aspire to, le- to lives of the same kind of value uh, that you and I can. So when we've got the two of them drowning, the reason to save uh, the human rather than the chicken isn't because we have higher status. It's because, well, it's like the Jack and Jill example. It's just that the human has more at stake. And so you'll be doing more good or preventing more harm, uh, preventing the loss of, le- you know, loss of less good uh, if you save the human rather. So that's, that's how the Unitarians within a Unitarian framework are able to accommodate uh, uh, the, the intuition that, of course, it's more important to save a human uh, than a dog or than a chicken, but that doesn't indicate differences in status. And, and I think moves like this can be made in a lot of ways, in a lot of areas, and so there's a fair bit to be said for the Unitarian position, even though I'm now about to, to suggest to you, but even though it's false, um, uh, so it seems to me. So uh, here's a kind of value uh, that uh, matters to a lot of us, uh, and, and that value is uh, equality, that uh, it matters whether, you know, so if you're better off uh, than, than she is through no fault of hers and, you know, no particular industriousness or merit on, on your part, uh, you know, we, we almost all are believers in the value of equality as a significant moral value. It's an instance of a distributive principle. And there are actually other distributive principles that would do the trick from running this argument as well. Some people don't really believe in the significance of equality per se. What they believe in, rather, is what's sometimes nowadays known as the priority principle. What's important is counting the well-being of the people at the bottom of the ladder more, in terms of their welfare, uh, than people higher up. Uh, so the question isn't really, are you better or worse than somebody else? It's just that you know, a unit, an extra unit of well-being does more moral good when added to the life of somebody who's badly off than it does to somebody who's moderately well off. And even uh, less good is done by adding the same one unit of well-being to somebody who's very well off. So we give priority to the worst off. That's the priority view. Some people believe in a distributive principle that's sufficiency or sufficientarianism. But the thought is, well, the relevant distributive principle is making sure that everybody's got kind of a decent life. There's a kind of minimally adequate, good enough life that we can all at least aspire to. And what our moral priority should be is getting the people who don't yet having that, have that life up to the level where they would have that life. Um, uh, and then maybe other considerations take off a- a- after that. So there are various distributive principles. I, I myself am a fan of, of dessert. Uh, moral dessert, the thought is it's important that people get what they deserve, but then among equally deserving people, it's going to be important that... All right. So, so there's a variety of d- distributive principles, and the, and the argument that I'm about to, to, to sketch uh, can be run, I think, for any of them. Um, uh, well, let's just do the equality one. I should say, by the by, uh, since he was so kind to, uh, uh, in his lies in introducing me, when Jeff introduced me, that uh, the earliest version of this argument with which I'm acquainted, I'm no scholar, so I can't really swear this is so. But nonetheless, the earliest version of the argument with which I'm acquainted is Jeff McMahon's. Uh, uh, and it seems to be kind of shocking that the, the literature hasn't taken up with this because it seems to be a really, really deep uh, and important point. And the, but the argument's very, very simple, which is, so remember five minutes ago when I was saying that um, chickens just don't have you know, as much at stake as, as, as we do, right? Because our lives are just contain all these goods and riches uh, that uh, chickens can't, can't have in their lives, given their limited psychological capacities. So let's just slap numbers on things for the sake of you know, concreteness. Um, you know, suppose that a typical human has a life of 100, uh, but maybe, I don't know, maybe chickens have lives of seven. I don't know if that's too generous to chickens, but it'll, you know, the precise number doesn't really matter. Okay, and now imagine that you're an egalitarian. And so equality matters, but since we've let chickens into the, the domain of creatures that count, that have moral standing, and we're Unitarians to boot, so that they have the very same moral status that we have, the very same claims that we have, um, it would follow uh, that uh, the creatures to whom, the beings to whom we owe our strongest egalitarian obligations to do what we can to correct inequality aren't 
you know, the, the poor people in central London, let alone in the third world, it's the chickens. Um, uh, or, you know, maybe mice have it worse than chickens. I, I don't know about enough about mice versus chickens or, or bugs or what have you. Um, you know, it, it's, we need to be, to the extent that equality matters to us in our moral theory, one of the things that we, helps us decide that one outcome is better or worse than another, it seems as though we need to be giving priority to, uh, well, helping raise as far as is possible the level of well-being of, well, chickens and mice and snakes and flies. Um, uh, I was discussing some of this with Jeff yesterday. He said, you know, there's not a whole lot we can do for mice. He said, well, you know, we could leave really high-quality cheese lying around. And, and, and of course, that, that just seems like a silly thing to do. And, of course, the thought is it is a silly thing to do. The egalitarian, but, but it's not because it wouldn't raise the level of well-being of the mice. It would raise the level of well-being of the mice. It's that despite the fact that we're egalitarians, we just don't think that they count in the same way when it comes to this distributive principle. But the Unitarians have to say they do count in the same way. And, and, and this appeal to you know, how we have more at stake than they do, that's not going to help them here. That just sort of ties them up, hoists them up with their own petard. Uh, you know, they were the ones who were pointing out how we've got it so much better off uh, uh, than, the, than the chickens do, um, or the cows. I just mentioned cows at least in passing, so you've got your money's worth um, uh, than the cows do. So, so it just seems to me that what... And, and you can run the same argument, maybe you can already see this, in terms of any of the other distributive, maybe not literally any distributive principle, but the other plausible distributive principles. I mean, suppose you were a, 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 a prioritarian and thought that you had to give priority to helping those at the bottom of the welfare ladder. Well, fl flies are really at the bottom of the house, uh, welfare ladder, uh, uh, house flies you know, compare, compared to us. And so that's where our priority ought to go. That just, just seems clearly wrong. The move, as far as I can see, the only, I mean, there are other moves that one could mention, but since I've already been going on uh, you know, too long about this, uh, I'm going to just skip over. There's other moves that you could try to mention, but it seems to me the obvious answer to say at this point is something like we need to distinguish different statuses, different categories of, of, of animals or creatures, uh, and say that uh, you know, we are high-status creatures, and somehow that's going to be taken into account when worrying about our egalitarian distributive principles vis-a-vis -vis the chickens and the mice and the, and the cows and, and so forth and so on. Suppose we had a way of uh, ranking animals, and here I mean us too, uh, in terms of our status. What are the rough thoughts going to be something about our psychological capacities? There's a lot more to say about that. I don't think I'll have time to do it, but roughly our psychological capacities, we have all sorts of fancy and sophisticated capacities that, that the flies don't have and the snakes don't have, uh, uh, and the dogs don't have, but the dogs have more of this than the, uh, uh, the flies do and, and so forth. So suppose we had a way of ranking, uh, and we could assign a number you know, to each uh, thing. Maybe we assign 100 to humans, uh, and then, I don't know, like, did I give seven to chickens before? You know, uh, the dog's got to be a whole lot better than that. Maybe 25 for dogs, um, uh, you know, and down, you know, from 100 to zero. Or maybe for certain purposes it might be convenient to, to normalize that to one uh, so that, you know, we all get ones um, and, uh, you know, the other animals get fractions of one down, down to zero. Just as a sidebar, because I find this a fascinating question, uh, if, if, if it ranges from, from one to zero, well, what about creatures that got more than one? You know, you know, could there be creatures with fancier cognitive capacities than we have who would have a higher status? I'll maybe say something about that later. Um, and, and, and one that I'm really intrigued by is, could you have negative status? Could, could there be... Could there be cre would it, I'm not sure exactly what it would, that would take. Would that be kind of, a kind of massive stupidity? that uh, stuck you with it? Or, or is it something, because status probably isn't just a function of your cognitive capacities, but maybe, maybe some of, something about like, your sensitivity to moral considerations play in as well. And so maybe a certain kind of demonic creature could have a negative, 
you know, demon dogs, uh, devil dogs or something could have, a, could, I don't know whether you can get negatives or, or not. But, but anyway, suppose that you can at least allow me the, the sort of the statuses from, from one to zero, then the, the basic thought's fairly straightforward, which is that somehow in thinking about the equality uh, distributive principle, we will relativize the strength of your equality claim to your status. So that the lower your status is, the weaker your claim becomes proportionally. The, the basic idea is fairly straightforward. Now, as it happens, actually working out the details of this, very complicated. Uh, some cases not so complicated, but in lots of other cases, very, very complicated. Let me just give you two, I'm going to give an instance of a, of a, of a non-complicated version and then an instance of, uh, of a complicated version. For the, for the non-complicated one, suppose you accept the priority view. So the priority thought, again, was there's a kind of multiplier where you, a unit of well-being gets multiplied and counts for more the lower off you are. And what we want that to do is, yeah, that's true for people at the same status, but if it's a lower status, then that's got to be corrected for the lower status. And you could correct by, assuming we have these fractional statuses, by dividing by your status. So that a creature that had a status of a half, when you divide by its well-being by half, that's the same thing as multiplying it by two. So as it were, uh, from, the egalit- from the prioritarian point of view, uh, it would be as though, yeah, although they really are only at, you know, whatever it is, 20 units of well-being, um, uh, each unit there, because of the division by its lower status, acts as though it's 40. And so that allows you to carry through the prioritarian amplification after first having done a correction for status. And, and if, if you don't follow the details, don't worry about it, because I'm not going to go any further with the, those details. But now let me say something quickly about a version that won't work. I, mean, I don't mean won't work, I just mean it's not as equally obvious how you're supposed to do it. Um, so suppose we're egalitarians, and we think somehow it's important that we have equality, but of course we don't really think it's important that there be, uh, uh, you know, that the, it's not as bad that the dogs don't have it as well off as, as we do. But since we do think they count, then they've got some kind of egalitarian claim. How are we going to correct this? Well, one way you might try to go is to create a baseline appropriate for each status of creature. You know, so there's a certain kind of baseline that we have a kind of egalitarian claim to um, uh, that's fairly high because of our high status. Uh, and uh, the, the, the dogs will have a, a claim to an egalitarian baseline that's significantly lower, but higher in turn than, than the chickens would have or the fish or the, let alone the, you know, the, the flies and so forth. And then you might say with, with, in terms of these two different baselines, we want equality relative to these status differentiated baselines. You know, have we dropped equal amounts below or above? Seems like a promising enough idea, although working out the details, again, just turns out to be surprisingly complicated. Let me very quickly say some, just to give you a taste of this. Suppose we thought, okay, so the relevant thing to do is, so what would the baseline be set at? A natural proposal, something like, look at what uh, you know, a typical creature like this can reasonably, how high off a life can they reasonably aspire to have? Um, or maybe, maybe the maybe the average that humans get or the highest that humans get, that somehow provides the baseline. And, and so obviously dogs can't have it as well off as we can, so maybe theirs is at 20 where ours is at 100. So as we start measuring distance, but let's suppose, below the baseline, if, this, if these are maxes, uh, then, uh, well, look, so suppose uh, the mouse uh, has uh, uh, a, a baseline of... Uh, of Uh, and a human has a baseline of 100. Right? That's the best that humans can aspire to is 100. Now, that's the best humans can aspire to. Most of us, maybe none of us, have that. Maybe we're lucky and we have 90. Right? So, so we're 10 units shy of the, of the baseline. And so then the first thought was, so the egalitarian here needs to say, uh, the status adjusted egalitarian says, okay, so just like we are 10 units below uh, uh, our uh, baseline, so the mouse should be 10 units below its baseline. But 
you know, the mouse's range might only be from plus two to negative two, but we just said it had to be 10 units below its top. That puts it at negative eight. That's not even necessarily, I mean, that seems unspeakably cruel, but beyond that, it doesn't even seem possible if the range is that small. So appeal to units isn't going to do it. Uh, percentages have their own problems. So it's just, it's just not obvious even if we've got the basic thought that we're going to have an egalitarian principle and it's going to be adjusted for hierarchy, it's not obvious how to do it. But let's just suppose you solve these various problems. You've got your favorite distributive principle. You've figured out the technical questions of how to adjust it for a hierarchy. There's a further question then, which is, look, some people don't believe in distributive principles. Classical utilitarianism, for example, says that you know, the thing to do is just bring about, the, the, this is a version of a consequentialist theory, bring about the best consequences. But they also say, okay, all that matters in evaluating consequences just is the amount of well-being. It doesn't matter how it's distributed. Maybe, as to take a simple version of it, it's just the, the, the greatest total. So they might say, you could imagine a unitarian utilitarian saying, yeah, you people who muddied up your moral theory with some distributive principles, you may need to introduce hierarchy, which was a really bad idea in the first place, and what we've just seen is one more of the costs among the many of why one should never have embraced distributive principles in the first place. So you can imagine somebody saying that. For what it's worth, I'm inclined to think, even when it comes time to asking how much good does it do to add more well-being, that too should be sensitive to uh, 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 status. In effect, what I'm saying is if you had a unit of mouse well-being and a unit of human well-being, uh, and you ask, I could add one of these to the world. Distribution is just bracketed. I could just add, you know, qua insofar as I care about making the world better by having more well-being. The Unitarians say at that point, well, a unit of mouse well-being is equal to a unit of uh, human well-being. A unit is a unit. And I, and I find myself thinking, no, I don't think that's right. I find myself thinking, in part just because I've been softened up by thinking about the distributive case, that, yeah, you know, how much good it does to add well-being to the world depends on uh, whose well-being it is. So it's not really true. I mean, of course, it is true that a unit is a unit, because what that means is a unit of well-being is a unit of well-being. But a unit of well-being doesn't necessarily have the same value independent of whose well-being it is. It may matter whose life you dropped it into. As a very loose analogy, I gave the same loose analogy actually at a lecture here at Oxford last summer. It shows how little progress I've made on this, and I'm still giving the same analogy. Uh, but as a very loose analogy, think about the significance of a drop of red paint on a painting. Well, you know, a, a cubic centimeter, not a cubic, but a, you know, a square centimeter of red is a square centimeter of red. Yeah, that's right, but that doesn't mean the aesthetic significance of it, the value it adds to the painting is the same, regardless of tell me something else about the kind of painting that it was dropped into. So I want to say something analogous when it comes to well-being, that you drop a unit of well-being into one of our lives, and it does more good to, from the moral point of view than when you drop a unit of well-being uh, into uh, the life of a creature with lower status. And when the Unitarian comes back and says, but pain is pain, I want to say, yeah, pain is pain, but insofar as that slogan means it doesn't matter except how painful it is, I say, no, that can't, be, that can't be right. There's lots of other places in ethics where we don't think something like that. Right? If, if two people are suffering in jail, equal amounts of suffering equally long times, and one of them is a guilty murderer, and one of them was framed, and I now have the option of saving one of them, getting them out of prison, saying, but pain is pain, is just missing the boat. The significance of the pain depends on contextual factors like whose kind of life you dropped it into. So I want to say the same thing maybe in, there in terms of dessert. I want to say the same thing in terms of uh, status as well. Now, at this point, obviously, there's lots of uh, questions about well, how exactly do we fix status. Um, uh, and I'm not really going to say anything about that except for one more thing that I believe in that's relatively controversial. So I think I should just throw it out. 
One of the things that Unitarians often appeal to by way of defending their own perspective is they start asking us to contemplate what we want to say about humans that are cognitively impaired. Imagine some severely cognitively impaired human. As I mentioned at the outset, there are humans that are not persons. And in principle, at least it seems as though with you've thrown enough severe brain damage, we can get as low a level of cognitive capacities uh, as you want, for the sake of example, that is. Uh, and so the Unitarians say, look, if you take this kind of hierarchy view that you're embracing, Shelley, then you're forced to say that it's appropriate to treat the severely cognitively impaired uh, human the same way as what we might call their cognitive peer. You know, if they've got the cognitive uh, functioning of a dog, then the same way as a dog, if it's a chicken, then the same way as a chicken and a fish, the same way as a fish, all the way down. And that strikes almost all of us as outrageously uh, unacceptable. This is called the problem of marginal cases, and that's, that's, you know, it's often thought to be one of the big problems for the kind of hierarchy view uh, that, that I'm embracing. And, and I'll say, yeah, all right, that, that actually does seem to me to be a, a, an intuitive uh, cost uh, of going here. Um, so the thing, I, the, 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 the non-popular thing I'm also inclined to accept is I don't actually think status is a function solely of your cognitive capacities. I think there's something true of the impaired human who's a non-person, namely there's a metaphysical truth. They could have been a person. So I, I call this modal personhood. And, and the thought I have that I'm attracted to is that being a modal person, that is something that could have been a person, should have been a person by now, but isn't a person, that amplifies your moral status. Uh, and so it gives you a bigger claim than your cognitive peers, let's say the dogs, who don't actually have that metaphysical property. Now, that's a controversial claim, but at least it softens somewhat the worry about marginal cases. Of course, if you had a very inflated view about the status-enhancing capacity of modal personhood, it could make the, the worry completely disappear. If you said possible you know, modal persons uh, counted exactly the same status as actual persons, then there would be no problem of marginal cases at all. I don't actually think it does that much amplification. I think it does some, but not all the way. So I do still have a version of it. But one shouldn't think that, so the moral of the story is to go run into Unitarianism, uh, because after all, Unitarians then are stuck with this thought that, oh, yeah, well, at least if you're an egalitarian Unitarian, we ought to be giving all our resources to doing, uh, making the life of mice better off. That strikes me as a much harder pill to swallow. Um, I, I should wrap this up. So let me just say a, 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 a you know, a couple of things. One, one last quick thing about uh, the, this appeal to modal personhood. I, I don't think this is going to happen only for modal personhood. You know, there presumably could be something like you know, a, a cognitively impaired dog who doesn't have the mental capacities of a normal dog. But it's a modal dog. It's something that could have been. And so I think there will be an analogous status-enhancing thing that goes on there, not all the way, but somewhat. So they'll be better off than their cognitive peers, and so forth and so on for various other statuses as well. There are philosophical objections one might raise of various sorts to this appeal to this modal feature, but uh, I, I'm not going to go there. And so let me just end by mentioning uh, uh, well, a, a couple of objections to hierarchy per se. Sometimes hierarchy, sometimes Unitarians criticizing hierarchy say, "Look, this is just an elitist view. You know, this is the sort of view that leads you to saying that you know whites count more than blacks and so forth, and or uh, you know women less than men or, or, or what have you." And I want to say, yeah, in some sense it's an elitist view, but that doesn't have any philosophical weight because elitism is just the label we, throw, we slap on it when there's a distinction drawn, giving some claims that others don't have, that we don't embrace. Almost everybody thinks, for example, that in deciding whose pain to, preserve, you know, to stop, we should pay attention to intensity. Right? More intense, intense pains count more morally than less intense pains. Well, you can imagine an anti-intensity theorist saying, you elitist, you think the intense pains count more? And of course, that would be laughable, because we all can just see that more intense pains count. 
Or, or imagine somebody says, you know, sometimes there are, there are moral views according to which, as I mentioned before, you know, the, 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 the claims of the guilty, the wrongdoers, count less than the claims of the innocent. And I mean, you can have, you elitist, you think that murderers count less than innocent people? Oh, well, yeah, I do think that, right? So I don't want to use the word elitist about my view because I just think it's the truth. Uh, and so all that elitism is, just, it's just name-calling. So the whole question, you know, we can't decide, you know, if, if we preserve the word elitism for the views that are false, then we don't know whether hierarchy and animal ethics is elitist until we decide whether or not hierarchy is the right view or not. Um, there's the problem about marginal cases, which you know, I've already mentioned. There's the problem I mentioned, I guess I won't have any time to say anything about, maybe next time, uh, about what about superior beings, you know, with even higher cognitive capacities, right? And actually, there's a problem that I think is the most worrisome of all and will emerge again tomorrow, and then maybe there'll be a solution, or at least I'll offer my pet proposal on uh, Wednesday, which is what I think of as the problem of normal variation. So the thing about marginal cases is, you know, they're really very, very far off in terms of their capacities from us. But within this room, there's probably variation anyway. I won't name names. Um, uh, but, but, you know, but, but some of you probably are just better at thinking things through or have a better, stronger sense of will or are or, or, or able to envision the future and so do better at autonomous planning than some of the rest of us uh, are. And so if these are the sorts of variations that make for higher status. Doesn't the hierarchy theorist have to say... Uh, look, some people in this room have higher moral status th than others, and their well-being counts more, and they've got a claim to a slightly bigger piece of the egalitarian uh, uh, pie and so forth. So, so this is the problem, as I say, of normal variation, because that really does strike me as very unpalatable. Uh, it, it, what we want to say is, yeah, among the people here in this room, we have the same status, but it looks as though the features that would ground moral status would allow for these differences of you know, variation that ought to ground differential status, and that seems an unacceptable implication of the theory. And so one of the things we're going to consider on Tuesday and Wednesday is whether that can be avoided. But that's it for tonight. Thanks.